to do the abbreviated version, the longer version with all the math calculations will be on the internet before very long. But we're looking now at the year of jubilees. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to meet with us now in the power and presence of your spirit. In your grace and mercy, Father, we pray that you'd open our eyes to your word, to its glory and to its meaning. More than this, Father, as always, we ask you for the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but by your grace, doers also. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Two Hebrew terms we have to look at first of all. I'm hoping I get this right. Ready? I'll write it in English. Shemitah and Omer. Shemitah is a cycle of seven either seven days or seven years. Some people call them heptads and things like this. But in Hebrew, it's a shemitah, a seven-year cycle. It's interesting that physiologically, even in human physiology, all the cells are replaced completely seven years. There's no cell that we have that was there seven years ago. Seven-year cycle. An omer is a counting of wheat growing during a cycle. It's a counting of wheat, of grain. It's a measurement of grain that you count during a fixed period of time. These two terms. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight of the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Actually, he would have rolled up a scroll called the Megillah. Gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, which has to do with purifying by fire, from Saruf in Hebrew, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. And all the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill in which the city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. 
Whenever you see the three and a half years referred to, when Elijah stopped the rain, it has a future prophetic meaning. It always relates to two times, time and a half time, or 1,260 days, or 42 months. It has a future significance. Whenever you see it, understand the passage has a future prophetic meaning eschatologically for the return of Christ, wherever you see it. For instance, look at the epistle of James very briefly. Chapter 5. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on earth for three years and six months. Whenever you see that three and a half years, it points to one half of the last seven years of history by the lunar calendar, somehow. But also you see Elijah. Elijah in some way comes again. We can talk a lot about those two witnesses, but almost everyone, in fact everyone agrees, one of them is in some way Elijah. It's going to come in the character of Elijah the way John the Baptist did. At the very least, some people would even go beyond that. So the context Jesus was speaking of is future. And it's half a Shemitah, half a seven-year period. It's half of a Shemitah, okay? The last seven years is broken into two halves. There's the future meaning. They get angry at Jesus because, as Luke records the words of Jesus, Luke was a convert to Judaism, but he was Syrophoenician, ethnically. And he was always keen to show how Jesus was saying that Gentiles would accept the Messiah when his own people wouldn't. And so by using the example of Elisha, or the widow at Zarephath, a Gentile woman, it got the Hebrews of Galilee angry. You're saying that the Gentiles are better than we are. Well, if they believe the truth and you reject it, yes. <laughs> it's got them angry. No prophet is welcome in his hometown. We've talked about this before on various recordings. Remember, unless it's children, unless they're children, most of the time, there can be exceptions, but most of the time, unless you're talking about children, the most difficult people to witness to are people who knew us before we were saved. Family, people who we grew up with, people who knew us before we were born again. Other people who meet you are going to accept you for what you are. But relatives and people who knew you, people who you grew up with, they're always going to relate to you for what you were. They're not going to be able to handle the new creation in the same way. Okay? They're very difficult. It's... All you, you reach a point with relatives and things, all you can do is pray and try to be a witness and see if the Lord can bring somebody else into their life and share the gospel with them because you, you wind up in arguments, you wind up, it becomes futile. It's very difficult. No prophet, well, that's talking about a prophet, of course, but it's a general truth. It's a general truth. Expect that when you're dealing with unsaved relatives or people who knew you before you were a Christian. Most of the time, it's not going to be easy. Most of the time, we're not the ones to lead them to Christ. That's not to say we shouldn't try, but it is to say that they're the toughest nuts to crack. Okay? But let's look at this now. The favorable year of the Lord in verse 19. What is the favorable year of the Lord? The favorable year of the Lord is Hashanah Hayovel. The year of Jubilee. Hashanah Hayovel. The year of Jubilee. Well, I have to explain something of the background. That's why I'm going to leave a lot of the maths out. Most of you know that Jesus fulfills the spring holy days of Israel in his first coming. Pesach. Passover, he's the Passover lamb. Okay. First fruits. 
1 Corinthians 20. The first day of the week, the high priest would bring the first fruits into the temple when it was still dark. Jesus was raising from the dead that very hour. Again, we have other teachings explaining this. Most of you know it. But then you have seven weeks later, you have a Shemitah of days called the Omer. The Omer. They're counting the amount of grain in the spring harvest. The 18th is an important day. It's called Lagba Omer, but it's altogether 49 days. The 50th, the day after these seven times seven days, is Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, or the Day of Pentecost. Then you have a huge break. The summer. There's no rain. What is the rain? You know what that is. The rain, Isaiah 44, 3, is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It goes into the water table and forms Maim Hayim, living water. In John 7, Jesus said, I'll give you living water. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is not poured on Israel for a long, hot summer. And the summer in Israel goes roughly from May to October. It's raining elsewhere. It's raining in the Gentile nations. Not Israel. The summer corresponds to the time of the Gentiles. This goes on but as you get towards the, into the second half of the summer, there is a day there that's called Tisha B'Av, when they commemorate the destruction of both the first and second temple. And they read the Book of Lamentations. But this goes on and on. And with Tisha B'Av, something happens, I'll explain in a moment. It goes on until you get to the High Holy Days. Today they call it Rosh Hashanah. Head of the year, Jewish New Year, but originally it was not that. It was the Feast of Trumpets. Yom Tru'ah. Then you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and finally the Feast of Tabernacles, Hag Sukkot. Very briefly, you'll have to get the tapes or get my book, The Final Words of Jesus, we explain it. Yom Teruah is the convocation of Israel for the Great Tribulation. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. We'll explain what that means. Why do you have a day when you have the blood of the lamb, but another day when it's the goat? Then you have Hag Sukkot, which is the beginning of the millennium, marks the millennium. At the end of the book of Zechariah, when Jesus comes back in chapter 12, the nations have to celebrate the Feast of Booths. John 7 is the Feast of Booths. Um, remember Peter wanted to build three booths? At the Transfiguration, he thought that was the beginning of the millennium. Now again, we have a book, the book, Final Words of Jesus explains this. I just mentioned it in passing. He fulfills the spring holy days in the, his first coming. Although elements of these spring holy days, elements of them, have meaning for his second coming, basically he fulfills the spring holy days in his first coming. He only partially fulfills the autumn holy days in his first coming. They are yet to be fulfilled. They were partially fulfilled in his first coming, but they are yet to be fulfilled. Okay. 
Again, this is a big subject in itself. But the same as you have seven sevens here, beginning with Tisha B'Av, you have another seven-week period leading up between Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah, you have another seven-week period. So the two balance. Additionally, you have the days of awe. Hayamim Hanoraim, literally a terrible ten-day period here between Rosh Hashanah, Yam Truah, and Atonement. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 1, please. Verse 3, to these he also presented himself alive after suffering many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. So between the ascension of Jesus and the day of Pentecost, you have a 10-day period. 10 in the spring, 10 in the autumn. You have a Shemitah, seven. In the spring, you have it in the autumn. First coming, second coming. Former rain, latter rain, the, you know, the outpouring of the Spirit on Israel. Okay. This is the nutshell version. You'll have to get the book if you want to understand it in depth. I know some of you already understand it. The Jews begin the Sabbath after the Feast of Tabernacles, their annual cycle or election of reading the Old Testament. This is called the Parakashavua, the portion of the week, the Torah and the Haftorah, the Law and the Prophets. They go back to Genesis 1-1 right after the Feast of Booths, Okay. Look with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. You see that in many portions? The portion of the week, hapada kashavua, that's what it's talking about. The annual reading in the synagogue goes back to the temple. That's how they read it. So in Luke chapter 4, they were reading the Parakashavua for that time. You understand? Jesus was ritually reading what would have been read at the synagogue to this day at that particular time of the year. So we know, therefore, Luke 4 took place when they were leading up to the high holy days. They were getting close to Rosh Hashanah and the Day of Atonement because they began at the Shabbat with the book of Isaiah, okay? And then they built up. So we know it was shortly before the High Holy Days when Jesus was reading Luke 4. What Jesus was reading Luke 4. But in Luke 4 it says to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he rolls up the scroll and everybody's looking at him. What is this? He's reading the Parakashavua, still read to this day at that time of the year. Look at the book of Isaiah, please, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, that is gospel, to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. But he doesn't finish reading the verse. He rolls up the scroll. Everybody is waiting for him to read the rest of the verse. That's why they're looking at him. Why didn't he finish reading the verse? That was the Padaka Shavuah. Because the rest of the verse says, the day of vengeance of our God. 
That is not his purpose in his first coming. That is his purpose in his second coming. In his first coming, he comes with grace to bring salvation. The judgment of God will come, the vengeance will come in the second coming. So he only reads half the verse. You understand? Time freezes between the time of the Jews and the time of the Gentiles. Time freezes. Israel is God's timepiece for the nations. The clock begins ticking again when you see the Jews back in Israel, back in Jerusalem, and when you see them beginning to accept Christ again, according to Romans 11, you know that clock is getting ready to tick. We're getting towards the last seven years. He only reads half the verse. The rest of it will be fulfilled at a future time. Now this is one example. There are others. Let's look at another example. Turn with me, please, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. Verse 10. I'll pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They'll look upon me who they have pierced, crucified, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Everybody see that verse? Well, let's look at the Gospel of St. John, John's crucifixion narrative, passion narrative in John's Gospel. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 19, verse 37. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon on him who they have pierced. Once again, it only quotes half the verse. They weren't mourning over him, except for his mother and his few disciples at a distance. They weren't mourning over him. They were yelling, crucify him. Why does it only quote half the verse? The other half has to be fulfilled at a future point. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, please, chapter 1. Verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. You see, the second half is fulfilled in his second coming. Time freezes. It's the time of the Gentiles. The rest of these verses are fulfilled when he comes back. Everybody understand why it cuts the verse in half. A Shemitah, a seven-year cycle, is cut in half. The ministry of Jesus was three and a half years. Where's the other three and a half? (laughs) Oh, it's coming. You understand? Cut in half. Now again, we can, this would take a long time if we did all the maths and everything. I'm just giving you the overview. So we pretty well know what was happening. This year of Jubilee is the favorable year of the Lord. But wait a minute. Is it a year of favor or is it a year of vengeance? Well, that depends. <laughs> to those in Christ, it will be the favorable year of the Lord. To those who are not, it'll be a day of vengeance. Turn with me, please, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. Verse 54, even if he's not redeemed by these means, he shall still go out in the year of Jubilee, the year when the captive is set free. Now look at chapter 25, verse 8. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths. Seven times seven. Shemitah. Of years for yourself. Forty-nine years. Seven times seven years. So you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely forty-nine years. So you have forty-nine days, right? Between... Shabbat Av 
and the High Holy Days. You have 49 days between Passover and Pentecost. Now you have 49 years. It's always seven times seven. You see this pattern in the story of Rahab's rescue and Joshua. You see this pattern in the book of Revelation. There's other places, but again, we're not doing the maths today. Then you shall sound the ram's horn, the shofar, on the tenth of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through the land. So on Yom Kippur, you're to blow the ram's horn on the year of Jubilee. 50th year. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land to all the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, a yovel. Each of you shall return to his own property. Each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth nor gather it from its untrimmed vines. It's a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its crops out of the field. On this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. If you make a sale, moreover, to your friend or buy from your friend's hand, you shall not wrong one another. Corresponding to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your friend. He is to sell to you according to the number of years of crops. In proportion to the extent of the years, you shall increase its price and its proportion to the fewness of the years, you shall diminish its price, for it is the number of crops. Again, that has to do with an omer, counting the amount of grain during the time period. You understand? He's selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear the Lord your God, for I am the Lord your God. There are multiple aspects of this. One of which, it shows God's legislation. This provides an idea of what it is going to be like during the millennial reign of Christ. People will not wrong one another. Everything will add up, everything will be fair, everything will be equitable. Nobody's going to get swindled or chiseled. Nobody. No real estate brokers, no lawyers, everything's going to be fair. No politicians. It's going to be right. The land was the Lord's. No mortgage foreclosures. If you lost your land through debt, it would be repatriated in the year of Jubilee. The person you owed the money to could temporarily have the land and use the agricultural production of it to regain what they lost. But in the year of Jubilee, it would have to be repatriated, going back to the apportionment of Joshua. There was no foreclosures. There was no foreclosures. You could only temporarily lose the land. You'd have to get it back in the year of Jubilee. Secondly, the Hebrews did not allow the institution of slavery. It was illegal. And when they did it, prophets like Amos would rail against it. The land was the Lord's. The people were the Lord's. You don't own them. They're God's. He did not allow slavery. He allowed indenturism. Bond servantship. You could be legally, contractually obligated to work for somebody until the year of Jubilee. But the servant had rights. If you knocked his tooth out, they went free immediately. Now they had the option, if they were well treated and liked it, of having a gold ring driven through their ear and remain voluntarily in the service of the master of the boss. But it was optional. God did not allow slavery. Now this created a big problem in the first century church. Because although Jewish believers had this concept that slavery was wrong, and Paul said things like, if you can get free, get free, the church was already being persecuted, and 25% of the Roman Empire was composed of slaves. The economy depended on it. And if Christians began abolitionism, it would have been seen as political sedition. So Paul said, if you can get free, get free. But he said it was no good. Now the Jewish believers understood slavery was no good, that God didn't want this. 
God said this was wrong. But Paul's idea was, as the gospel prospered, slavery would disappear of its own accord. That, that was his thinking. Well, that, that, then that's pretty much what happened. You go free the year of Jubilee. You get back what you lost the year of Jubilee. The ultimate year of Jubilee, we've had a penultimate and an ultimate. When Jesus set us free, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. He who commits sin is slave to sin. We have been free from the yoke of slavery. When I was a teenager, I was addicted to cocaine. I was a slave to a drug. I'm not a slave to that drug. The Lord set me free. I have a new master. The Lord said, the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. I've been in parties and stuff when people were smoking marijuana and taking and I had no temptation. I could witness, well, to try to be a witness for the Lord around unsaved people. Why? Because it didn't have any domination over me anymore. It didn't own me anymore. I was set free by the Son. Now, I had to go through a growth period where I kept away from everything. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to classical music or rock music, especially for about two and a half or three years after I got saved before I could be in an environment where it wouldn't affect me spiritually. I'm not saying I didn't have to be in an incubator, but he set me free of these things. He set me free of it. Well, if he said, that's my, is a year of jubilee. That's the penultimate. The ultimate will be where we won't have to worry about cancer. <laughs> <laughs> these deplorable chunks of protoplasm only have to last us until we get a glorified body. As I tell people, even I'm going to be good looking. <laughs> There's a year of Jubilee coming. The favorable year of the Lord. The meek shall inherit the earth. We get this back, you understand? We get the land back. We get the land back. It's coming. So it's the year of Jubilee that's coming. But it was blown on Yom Kippur. That was when it happened. It was not just the year, it was a specific day in the year, Yom Kippur. Everybody understand? Yom Kippur, we read about it in Hebrews. Two goats, identical appearance, age, and weight. The high priest would choose one by lot for the Lord, and he would choose one as the Ezazel, the scapegoat. He put his hands on the goats. One would die so one could go free. Some people see a double typology in this. But he would impart the sins of the people in symbol onto the goats. And as most of you know, they would parade the goats through the streets of Jerusalem, spitting on them and cursing at them and hitting them with sticks and throwing stones at them and kicking them in this parade or procession for their sin. Goats would be taken outside the city. One would be killed, but then its blood would be brought into the temple. And only once a year, the high priest, the Aaronic high priest, would go into the Holy of Holies and apply the blood before the ark once a year. Okay. That's what John the Baptist's father was doing, except, of course, the ark was not in the second temple. That's another subject. The other would be released into the wilderness. But by the time of Jesus, they had a problem. The goat came back once. They took it a distance of 90 stadia with resting points along the way for the people to a cliff in the wilderness outside Jerusalem, not in Jerusalem, a fair distance from Jerusalem. The high priest wore special vestments once a year on Yom Kippur, a white tunic with a scarlet sash based on Isaiah 118. Though your sins like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, and they'd cut it in half. Half that would hang before the Holy of Holies where the blood of the goat that was for the Lord was brought in. The other half would be tied between the horns of the Azazel, the scapegoat. Azazel, in Semitic languages, has to do with the devil. The devil. Azazel. Se'er Azazel. The other is for the Lord. 
If the people's sins were forgiven, the one hanging before, according to the Mishnah, the one hanging before the Holy of Holies would turn white. But your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If the people's sins were not forgiven, it would not turn white. And it says in the Mishnah, well, it's in, you have to put two different passages together in the Mishnah, but for 40 years before the temple was destroyed, it did not turn white. Once the Messiah was rejected by Israel, the sins of the Jewish people were never again forgiven on the Day of Atonement. Now you have to understand the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Kapora. Kapora means to cover. If a Hebrew had real faith and real repentance, the blood of the goat would temporarily cover their sin until the Messiah came and removed it. You understand? It was a temporary provision. Like a cover note for insurance before you get the certificate. It makes it legal to drive. But it's still not the certificate. It just says that there's one coming. Well, so too, Kapura, it was a temporary provision until the Messiah came. The Old Testament saints could not go to heaven until Jesus came and died for their sin. They're saved by the same blood of Jesus as we are. They were in the bosom of Abraham. Well, anyways... This was one goat in the temple. The other was the Azazel. So they take it out this distance of 90 stadia and push it off a cliff and kill it. So first, one goat that's chosen to be for the Lord is sacrificed and it's blood brought into the Holy of Holies. But then the other one is taken out and pushed off a cliff and killed. Okay, It's thrown into off a cliff. Let's go back now to Luke chapter 4. What do they try to do with Jesus? Throw him off the cliff. What time of year is it? They're reading Isaiah 61. They're getting ready for Yom Kippur. You understand? That's what they're looking forward to, counting from Tisha B'Av. Now the rabbis have since deleted this. From the liturgy, from the Machzor, they've deleted it from the Perakashavua, from the Mach, uh, not the Machzor, from the uh, Siddur. They've deleted it. Anything that Jesus quoted from the Old Testament, the rabbis have taken out. But we have an ancient Siddur from Egypt in the 8th century that was not edited by the rabbis. They were afraid of Islam, they were not afraid of Christians. And it was in there. Now the rabbis begin reading Isaiah 61 and verse 11. But in the time of Jesus, they began in verse 1. They took it out after he came because he quoted it. you understand? Quite a thing. So they're getting ready for Yom Kippur and they're reading this. The favorable year of the Lord. But he tells them what they don't want to hear. The Gentiles are going to repent when the Jews don't. He's not welcome in his own hometown by his own people. It's only a favorable year of the Lord for the Gentiles. Not for Israel, he says, except for the remnant. So they try to throw him off a cliff. But they couldn't throw him off the cliff. Why? Why? They had the wrong goat. You understand? He was the other one. He had to die in Jerusalem. (laughs) They had the wrong goat. They couldn't kill him. They had the wrong goat. So the other goat still has to die. Who's this other goat? The Azazel. It's the devil. Jesus defeated Satan in his first coming. But he's going to utterly destroy him in his second. The Azazel is going off the cliff. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. You understand? Satan's going to be destroyed. The Son of Man came that the works of Satan will be destroyed. He's going to utterly destroy Satan in his second coming. That will be the favorable year of the Lord. Right now, Satan's the god of this world. But when Jesus comes back, he won't be. He's going off the cliff. You understand? You understand what's happening here? 
Pay attention. You don't get this stuff in theological cemeteries. <laughs> it's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, there's more to it than this. I just don't, we don't have time for the detail on a Sunday morning. We could do a whole day just on this stuff. I mean, easy. I mean, it, but it, it just takes time. I refer you to the books and things. Well, anyway, let's look forward now. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Does everybody understand what I said so far? Everybody got it, at least the gist of it. Forgive my New York accent. Sandra and, and, and Angela have been promising to teach me scouts for years, but they've never done them. <laughs> Daniel 9, 24. Jesus could not have possibly been born in 1 A.D. Because Herod the Great died in 4 B.C. So Jesus already had to be born by at least 4 B.C. He might have even been two years old or something. Okay. It doesn't say he died when he was 30 or began his ministry when he was 30. It says about 30. Okay. About 30. But it was not one. When you count this out, the year of his ministry could have begun as early as 27 A.D. And he could have died anywhere between 31 and 33 A.D. Nobody can be sure there are different views. All of the views have a certain amount of support. But nobody knows for sure. I've read all the main views. I've read the views of the... Evangelical Fellowship of Mathematicians, they tried to work it out. It goes back to Robert Anderson, the astronomer. He tried to work it out, but nobody knows for sure. Edersheim tried to work it out. Nobody knows exactly for sure, but it was around then. Could have been 31, 32, 33. We don't know yet for sure. So we're dealing with approximations. Now, Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people. That is 70 sevens, Shemitah, right? Seventy of them. Seventy sevens is 490. And your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Obviously, this is messianic. In their desperation, the rabbis have come up with some really odd things. One says, this is a prophecy about an obscure figure named Yotam, Jotham. Not the Jotham from Judges 8, a different Jotham, who nobody ever heard of, hardly. Which is absurd. He didn't get rid of sin and bring it everlasting righteousness. But what the Talmud also says is, there's a curse on reading Daniel 9. For the time of the Messiah's coming is foretold in it. Isaiah 53 is not really the forbidden chapter. It's Daniel Nine, that's the forbidden chapter. The half Torah already existed at the time of Jesus, so they didn't ban Isaiah 53 from the annual reading, from the Pentecost Shavua. They weren't reading it before he came along. It's a bad argument. But what is forbidden is Daniel 9. It actually says there's a curse on reading it. And one rabbi did read it and he became a believer. Rabbi Leopold Cohen founded Chosen People Ministries, as it's called today. Became a Baptist minister. So you are to know and discern, verse 25, that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That is 49 years plus 7 times 62 years. 
It'll be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Then, after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood even to the end. There will be war. Desolations are determined. Notice, one of the reasons unsaved Jewish people will reject Yeshua as the Messiah. Well, he didn't bring in worldwide peace. That is not his purpose in his first coming. His purpose in his first coming is to be an atonement for sin. Wars and desolations are determined till the end. It's in his second coming. Again, I'd refer you to the book, The Final Words of Jesus. We explain Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David, if you are unfamiliar with it. One Messiah, two comings. Then it goes on. There will And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings on the wing of abominations. This is the Shikutsa Meshomem, the abomination of desolations. Will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Babylon fell in 539 B.C. in fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah, chapters 44 and 45, among other passages. Okay. You had Cyrus, Kirush, Cyrus the Great, the Persian. You had Darius the Mede, and you had Artaxerxes, who was married to Queen Esther. Ahasuerus. All three of them issued decrees beneficial to the Jews to return to the land, to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. You can argue, dispute which of the decrees Daniel is referring to. Scholars, saved Christian theologians are not of one mind. They're divided. They always have been. But it all works out within a couple of years of each other. First of all, it says... He, in verse 27, will make a firm covenant with many for one week. John Calvin churned out a lot of baloney. Most of what Calvin said was a lot of baloney. A cheap brand of baloney. The Calvinists to this day, many of them, believe that this is Jesus. It's the Antichrist who makes the covenant and breaks it. That's nonsense. Where was Jesus' ministry ever seven years? <laughs> It was three and a half years. The Antichrist will demand equal time and get it. So forget that. The abomination of desolation has nothing to do with Jesus, except that he warned about it. Seventy weeks, and it's broken down accordingly. Sixty-two weeks... And seven weeks. So, 49 years. After the decree of Artaxerxes, thereabout, it took 49 years for the second temple to be rebuilt, along with the city. What you read about in Ezra, Haggai, and Nehemiah. 49 years. Once the temple's rebuilt and sacrifices begin properly again, then you have seven times 62. 434 years. To a total of 69 Shemitot. When you count this out, it would come to anywhere depending on which decree you go by. Artaxerxes, Cyrus, or Darius. Somewhere between the spring of 31 AD and the spring of 33 AD.
But no matter how you count it, you're still missing one. We're still missing seven years. We're missing a full Shemitah. Everybody understand? That Shemitah will come when the time of the Gentiles ends. The time of the Gentiles is already ending. But when you see the temple rebuilt, when you see the prophecy of Revelation 11, when part of it's in the Gentiles, part of it's with the Jews, things are revving up. And it's coming. Somehow the Antichrist is going to make this treaty. He's going to bamboozle the Jews and they're going to believe him. Up until such point as they find out they've been conned. This will be very much like what happened with the Romans. The Roman general Pompey came and made this treaty promising to protect the Jews from their enemies or prospective enemies. Instead, they found out Rome was the boss. It's like going to the American Mafia for protection. Well, they'll protect you, but not for your interest, for their own. Pompey enters the Holy of Holies. Whenever you see somebody other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement enter the Holy of Holies, it's a picture of the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation. Do you understand? This three and a half year period will replay what Antiochus Epiphanes did in the story of Hanukkah, which Jesus celebrated in John 10. Again, another, you'll have to get the tapes. It's a big subject. But we're missing a year. We're missing the 70th week. The 49, then the 50. We're missing it. It's coming. And when it comes, something's going to happen. Satan is going to be destroyed. The Azazel is going to be destroyed. The meek shall inherit the earth. The captives are going to be set free. The favorable year of the Lord is going to happen. Now for those in Christ, penultimately it's happened already. You understand? We have salvation. It's like somebody, well, bad analogy, but you win the lottery ticket, but you haven't got the check in the mail yet. Well, we've won the lottery, but we're waiting for the check. It's coming. However, it is a day of vengeance. It's a day of wrath. A day of anger. When the Lord comes back, it's going to be a day of vengeance and anger. Or it's going to be a day of jubilee, of liberation, of enrichment, of the best dream of best dreams becoming a reality. One way or another, we're missing a Shemitah. But it's going to come. It is going to come. The question is, when it comes, will it be our jubilee? Or will it be our demise? Will it be the favorable year of the Lord? Or will it be the day of vengeance of our God? To those who are not in Christ, to those who are not truly born again and who long for the appearance of his coming, who say in their heart, Maranatha, to those who are like the wise virgins waiting for the bridegroom to come, it's one thing. But to the others, it will not be 
It'll not be the favorable year of the Lord. It'll be the day of vengeance. Let them have their same-sex marriage, their homosexual adoption. Let them have, you know, interfaith union with Islam. Let them have what they want. The day of vengeance is coming. God mocks his enemies. He actually mocks his enemies. We're told that. Divine humor is mockery of his enemies. It's like you see with Elijah. God mocks his enemies. These people who think they're defying God. The Eurovision was won last night by a, a, a transvestite with a beard. Work that out. I think a time is going to come when the, the normal people will be the freaks. That's how weird society is. Normal people are going to be freaks. God mocks this stuff. They don't know what's on the horizon for them. They've given over to it. It's a day of vengeance. But for those who've had enough of this, who are sickened by this wickedness, that you can't even bring your children up or watch your grandchildren grow up in a normal world, and homosexuals controlling the schools and everything and get, trying to get your kids. I just want Jesus to come. The day of vengeance is coming for those people. But the favorable year of the Lord is coming for the people of God. This is indeed Hashanah Hayovel, the year of Jubilee.